In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your... 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Next on Primetime, Georgia's shelter in place expiring at midnight tonight, but it's not going to be back to life as usual. We are breaking down the restrictions that will still be in place even after the order ends. Plus, you've heard of the swab test and the antibody test, but now there is a third kind that costs a lot less and is easier to perform. We'll show you how it works and why it could play a big role in allowing more people to get tested. And send the love from a Decatur woman helping others one stitch at a time to a very special birthday parade in Fayetteville. We are sharing your stories of how you're staying connected through all of this. And welcome everyone on this Thursday night. We begin with Governor Kemp's will not, he will not extend the state shelter in place order, which had been set to expire at midnight tonight. Cheryl Preheim had talked to the governor earlier this afternoon. He says the move is about protecting lives and the livelihoods of Georgians. We will hear from him coming up in a couple of minutes. The governor still urging people in Georgia, though, to stay at home and ending or extending rather the public health state of emergency. That order may be ending, but the state is still asking all of us to follow some very strict guidelines. The governor made the announcement on Twitter earlier this afternoon. Georgia's main shelter in place order will expire tonight for many of us, but there are still restrictions in place for some Georgians. Here's what we're talking about. Governor Kemp has extended the shelter in place order for several groups through June 12th, about a month and a half uh, beyond where we are right now. That's for people 65 and older, those who live in nursing facilities, those long term care facilities as well, and those who have pre existing conditions. That's like chronic lung health disease issues, severe heart disease, diabetes, moderate to severe asthma, and severe obesity, just to name a few. Now, all of the businesses that reopened within the past few weeks will continue to operate. That's those gyms, barbers, stylists, nail techs and tattoo shops, and bowling alleys, along with dine-in restaurant service and movie theaters. They must still, though, meet previously released sanitary and distancing guidelines, but some businesses are still a no-go here. Bars and nightclubs, amusement parks, live performance venues, and public swimming pools must remain closed through 11.59 p.m. on May 13th, unless that time frame is extended. The governor says the rules vary by business for a measured health-driven approach. The health and well-being of Georgians are my top priorities, and my decisions are based on data and advice from health officials. I will do what is necessary to protect the lives and the livelihoods of our people. Our thing to note that ban on large gatherings does remain in place. Businesses and governments cannot allow more than 10 people in a single location unless they're six feet between them. But that does not include family units or single households. And tonight we're hearing from city and county leaders about their reactions and next steps. Elvin Lopez spoke with the mayor of Athens-Clark County who expressed concerns about his community. 
Athens Mayor Kelly Gertz says he's worried about his community now that Governor Brian Kemp has decided to allow for the shelter in place order to expire tonight. Gertz says data doesn't seem to indicate that we as a state are in the clear yet. He says he will continue to encourage Athens to shelter in place until they see a two week decline in active new COVID-19 cases and then start a face to face approach. Gertz says he is concerned about mixed messages during this pandemic with Governor Kemp's decision to move forward by allowing the shelter in place order to expire and individual community leaders asking their cities to stay put. We're in a community of 130,000 people and under normal circumstances, more than 40,000 people come into our community every day to work. And so we, we do need to be unified and the unifying message that I'll continue to send is to look at the data and when the data indicate that it's safe for the first phase of reopening. That's when I'm going to encourage that. Gert says he also worries if we don't continue to shelter in place that we could see not only a second wave of COVID-19 cases, but possibly a series of waves. Well, the conversation about reopening has centered around whether fewer people in Georgia are getting sick. The latest numbers show more than 26,000 people have tested positive for the virus. That's up about 20% from last week. More than 1,100 people have died, a 28% increase from just last week. But more testing, of course, means more reported cases. 11 Live's Cheryl Preheim had the chance to speak with Governor Kemp directly about his decision to let the shelter in place order expire and what he is seeing in state data about our trend. And I know it is kind of counterintuitive to people when they see the number of cases that are going up. That is actually a good thing because it means that we're testing more. But what else is good that we're seeing right now? We're really watching this trend. The number of cases, the number of tests are going up, and but the percentage of the positive cases to the number of tests continues to drop. And that's what we want to continue to see. So we're testing more, but the number of positives we're getting, that percentage is dropping. So that is a very good sign. You've talked a lot about extending that hospital bed capacity and also the number of ventilators. Where does that stand and how much has that factored into your decision to go ahead and lift the overall shelter in place? Well, it's a big part of it. I mean, that's a, that's some of the data that we're following those numbers literally every day. I get an update seven days a week on that. Uh, we had the lowest ventilator use today that, than we've had in a long time. Our hospital bed capacity continues to be in really good shape. Uh, so, you know, and that's really what the all these uh, previous orders were doing was allowing us time to help flatten the curve and really build up that capacity. And now that we've done that, uh, I felt like it was time for us to move forward. We'll have Cheryl's full interview with Governor Kemp coming up in the next half hour. The governor says the state will watch the numbers, make decisions based on any changes, knowing the virus is not going away. A lot of you have asked us how, when we will know if reopening a business leads to another spike in cases here. Joe Hankey talked to one of the top doctors in the state of Georgia to get you some answers. There's already been some recent events such as businesses reopening that led to people leaving their houses. Now the shelter in place order for the state is set to expire at midnight. I talked with, epidemi with an epidemiologist from university from the University of Emory University, excuse me, Robert Benarchek. He tells me that he'll be interested to see the reporting of new COVID-19 cases for the state in about two to three weeks. That's when current events start showing up in the reporting by the state. He said he was already doing that, watching the numbers closely this week for Easter and Passover, since we're now about two weeks out or multiple weeks out from those uh, events. And he said he was curious to see if families came together in person for the holidays. That could have potentially led to a spike in numbers. But our check says he will be interested to see the numbers again starting in a couple of weeks with hair salons, barber shops, other businesses opening last Friday. Then restaurants opened on Monday and now the shelter in place set to expire at midnight. And then tomorrow, Simon Properties, they've announced they will be opening seven Georgia malls. And even if we see um, some of the numbers starting to decline a little bit over the next few weeks, um, that doesn't mean that they can't come back up again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, once individuals who, who may have been exposed um, have, have that time to, um, to, to become ill and, and to go and, and get tested. 
And Dr. Benarchek there tells me right now research still shows around 14 days is the window that someone can go from being infected until the end of sort of when they would have symptoms showing. He then it says that of course it takes time for them to get tested for those results to be reported back to them. So that's why it could take two weeks, if not up to three weeks, before we know the actual impact of Georgia's decisions to reopen. As soon as the governor made this announcement, we began hearing from people all across the state of Georgia. Some of you agree with the decision to let the order expire. Some of you upset or worried, and you do want to weigh in. So you can cast your vote in on our online poll by going to 11alive.com slash vote. Here is what a few Georgians had to say about the decision. Yes, my name is Dr. Carolyn Shepard, and I'm calling from Athens, Georgia. Viola Smith, I live in South Fulton, Atlanta. Hi, this is Greg from Canton. I support the governor and what he is doing. It was just ridiculous seeing all the people going about as normal without masks. Hi, my name is Miriam. I think um, Mr. Kemp is doing the right thing. It's just horrible, and I hate that Governor Kemp reopened up the city because it's giving them false hope. You can't just leave the country closed or Georgia closed. I know it's hard for most of the people, but if you do the social distancing, it will work. I definitely do not like the idea of help reopen up a small business. It's not safe. I hope and pray that Governor Kemp does not extend the shelter in place. I have mixed feelings about lifting the stay in place tonight. I can understand both sides. I mean, we need to get out and start coming back to some semblance of everyday life. But I just hope that everybody is considerate and has some type of responsibility in moving forward. We can't go back to where we were three months ago or it's going to be even worse. Thank you and be safe. Well, we want to hear what you think about Georgia's shelter in place order expiring tonight. Call and leave us a message at 678-765-9514. Be sure to leave your name, number, and where you live. We may share your comments on air. Well, so many of us know someone directly affected by the virus, and you're reaching out to us to share the good news of recovery. Today, after 30 days in an ICU, a Metro Atlanta man was finally released from the hospital. Our Caitlin Ross shares his story tonight. In this room, in this room. Can't go out the door. For 30 days, Robert Grant has lived in this 12 by 12 room at Emory St. Joseph's. They had me tied down. I couldn't move. I can't do this. I want out of here. I was so afraid. He was on a ventilator for 13 of those days and couldn't understand why he couldn't see his wife. I'm trying to tell them I want my wife. At the time, I couldn't didn't realize that there was no visitors allowed in the hospital. He says talking with her over FaceTime every day got him through COVID-19. My wife has been very supportive. If I need some, she would drop it off at the desk. He was encouraged, too, by everyone who took care of him over the past month. He is so grateful for the care and support he got from the health care workers who always believed he would recover. Have faith and do what the doctors tell you to do. Robert's being discharged from the hospital today, but he can't go home yet. He'll be transported to a rehab facility where he'll continue to gain strength and hopefully continue his recovery. Next on Prime Time, looking toward a third coronavirus test. NBC News medical correspondent Dr. Lippy Roy joins us to talk about tests and how they work. And don't forget, we are streaming all three hours of 11 Alive News Primetime on our YouTube channel right now. You can subscribe, get in on the conversation, let us know what you think in the community section. There's more 11 Alive News in Primetime after this break. Live to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. 
quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. landmark turning into a coronavirus testing site. The Arthur Blank and LA based Core Response are setting up a site at the Home Depot backyard near Mercedes Benz Stadium. The plan is for testing to take place weekdays from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. They would like people to pre register, but there is also on site registration available. Gwinnett County's transit system taking steps to make buses safer, but issues remain at transit systems all around the metro. 11 Live's Doug Richards has more on what's at stake. Well, Gwinnett County's transit system has reduced its schedule. It is still continuing to run buses, however, and its drivers are trying to find ways to reduce the ways that they and passengers uh, would be exposed on buses to COVID-19. Gwinnett County buses have limited the number of passengers on each bus and implemented other steps to reduce COVID-19 exposure. That's a risk for both passengers and bus operators. Operators represented by the Amalgamated Transit Union have been in talks with Gwinnett, Marta, and Cobb County's bus systems to lower those risks. The union has asked for hazard pay, PPE, and other safety gear, requiring masks for passengers and paid COVID-19 testing for transit workers, among other things. What we're looking for, in addition, what we're looking for is pandemic leave um, protection. Brett Dunham's is the local union president. We need something that, um, if they need to take off for this COVID-19, it will actually protect them as far as their wages and the benefits. The company that operates Gwinnett County's bus system says some of those requests have been addressed and that drivers are still getting paid full time while working fewer hours during the state of emergency. The health and safety of our employees and the community we serve remains our top priority at all times. TransDev and Gwinnett County Transit have been closely collaborating to address the emerging situation. The company operating Gwinnett Transit told us in a statement. And the union uh, has been in talks with Cobb County's transit system or the company that operates that transit system to improve conditions there. The union says that MARTA uh, has uh, actually given drivers a one-time bonus for working during the pandemic. President Trump has launched Operation Warp Speed to get a vaccination for COVID-19 as fast as possible. Dr. Anthony Fauci says he believes the United States could have a vaccine by January. He says we need to move quickly, but we also need to make sure any vaccine is safe and effective. Joining me now to talk more about it, internal medicine physician and NBC News medical correspondent, Dr. Lippy Roy, thanks for the time. As U.S. companies really make this move to try to fast track developing a vaccine, how might that speed up the process and what we've been warned could be long and methodical? 
Yeah, I, I think the, the White House is calling this Operation Warp Speed. Uh, look, if that means more funding to uh, recruit more scientists and doctors and researchers, so more manpower, as well as maybe more supplies, that's, that's great. But there are certain parts of the process, the vaccine discovery process, that really can't be rushed. Not if you want to do it accurately and well, which is the, really the clinical trial part, where we're testing the vaccine in actual human beings. Remember, the phase one of clinical trials is safety. Phase two is efficacy. And then phase three is doing phase one and two in a large scale. Um, and all of that takes a long time. It takes on average five years, if not even longer, to make a vaccine. So the fact that we're trying to rush it into less than two years, um, it, it's, it's going to be very difficult. Um, so, yeah, I don't anticipate uh, a vaccine coming out in under uh, a year at least. There has been some progress when we talk about testing. We've heard so much about the two different kinds, which would be the infection test and the antibody test. But talk about this third test now, the antigen test, and how it's, what, cheaper to make and easier to use? So, yeah, that's a great question, and it gets really confusing with all these different testing uh, regimens out there. So the, the PCR test that was being done, that nasopharyngeal swab, that's a diagnostic test looking for uh, viral particles. This antigen test will be similar in that it's, uh, to the PCR test in that it's, a, it's also a diagnostic test, but it's just looking for uh, something different on the actual virus, uh, surface particles on, on, on the virus's surface. Um, yeah, ideally, it, it'll be a rapid test, but the key piece is going to be is that is it accurate we the last thing we need is a test that doesn't have sensitivity or specificity um, and the last thing we want is false negatives and false positives so we need to make sure yes that it's ideally rapid mm -hmm. but also that it's accurate dr. Roy thanks for the time appreciate it Lester Holt will have much more coming up on NBC Nightly News at 630 including more information about a vaccine and how it would be distributed I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. I know you felt that cooler air out there today and the breezy conditions. It is going to remain cool tonight, but the breezes are going to start dying down through the evening hours. Watch how these temperatures will fall from the 60s this hour back into the 50s next hour and through the late night hours and then falling into the lower 50s here by tomorrow morning. And you'll see here that the cloud symbol is disappearing from our graphics, and that's indicating that uh, clearing sky that we're going to be experiencing out there for tonight. It's going to be a great day on Saturday. Saturday, despite the cooler start in the morning in the low 50s, we're going to get up into the 70s in the afternoon. So finally, warming up today was below average tomorrow, just a little below the average, but we're still going to go with an 11 on the wisometer with that bright sunshine, dry air in place. It's going to be crystal clear, looking very nice. Now for tonight, you can see uh, that we're going to be clearing the clouds disappearing tonight. And then in the morning, mostly sunny skies. It's that cool start, but you'll notice those temperatures warming pretty quickly during the day tomorrow. We'll see mostly sunny skies and then by afternoon, we get up into those uh, 70s there, low to even mid 70s in some spots. And then that warming trend continues heading into Saturday. Now notice Saturday morning, we start off with mostly sunny skies, but then we'll have just a couple of clouds that will mix in at times in the afternoon, still mostly sunny. It's going to be looking really nice out there during the daytime hours. And then as we uh, go through after lunch, we're going to see a uh, a great visibility for the flyover of the Thunderbirds and the Blue Angels, where we will see sunny skies, warm air, 77 degrees. Now, they have changed the time a little bit. Earlier, we were reporting after 2 o'clock. Now, they're saying 135, and we still don't quite know the exact flight path yet. They're supposed to release that on your Friday. So here's a look at that extended outlook into Sunday. Still looking good. Monday, a couple of showers mainly in North Georgia. Then Tuesday, we're going to see some scattered showers move our way. Maybe a little bit of thunder of that right now. It doesn't look like a, a system to worry about, but we'll keep you posted if that changes. Here's that seven day outlook. 73 for a high Friday, 81 Saturday. That warm up continues Sunday, Monday and Tuesday, mid 80s. But we will see a 20 to 30 percent chance for showers Monday into Tuesday, back to 20 percent Wednesday, clearing out on Thursday with some cooler air returning for next week. All right, Chris, despite the pandemic, it is important to send love. So we go to Fulton County where Chalk is being used in an inspiring way. Seven-year-old Hazel Halitsky loves to draw. She also has a giving heart, so she offered to draw chalk of art in her neighbor's driveway in exchange for donations. She wasn't expecting to raise much, but in just one week, she has over 
20 orders, food donations, collected more than $800. She plans to donate all the proceeds to the Community Assistance Center in Sandy Springs. Be sure to let us know the good things that you're seeing around you. All you have to do is use the hashtag SendTheLoveATL. Next on Primetime, is the White House really selling commemorative COVID-19 coins? Our Verified team is looking in on that after the break. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. The Verify team is here to get the facts and dispel misinformation online. Like these tweets that claim that the White House is selling commemorative coins for COVID-19 sparking outrage for many. So let's verify, is it the White House that's selling these coins? We track the coins down to this site, whitehousegiftshop.com. And that's our first clue. A government-run website would be .gov, not .com. Although it's no surprise that some are confused. With the seal in the corner, photos of the White House, and a similar color scheme, it looks a lot like the official White House page. The Verify team spoke with the CEO of the gift shop, Tony Giannini, via email. It turns out a variation of this shop has been around since 1946 and was once located in the White House basement. But Giannini confirmed that's not the case anymore. His company, Giannini Strategic LLC, took over operations in 2012. And it's clearly written right on their website, no government funds or resources are ever used in the operations of the shop. So we can verify, false. The White House is not selling COVID-19 commemorative coins it's a private company. By the way, Giannini tells me they've already sold nearly a thousand of those coins, netting about $100,000. He says he's gonna personally match every dollar with all the money going to the CDC Foundation and the Johns Hopkins Kimmel Cancer Center. Next on Primetime, people recovering from COVID-19 facing yet another obstacle, the mounting medical cost of their, of their treatment. Every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. 
quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. At midnight, Georgia's shelter-in-place order will expire. Governor Kemp choosing not to renew it, but still urging people to stay home as much as possible and to practice strict social distancing guidelines. He also says at-risk groups should continue to shelter in place until June 12th. That is for people 65 and older. Those living in nursing homes or long-term care facilities and those with pre-existing conditions like chronic lung disease, severe heart disease, diabetes, moderate to severe asthma, and severe obesity, to name a few. And even with the shelter-in-place order ending tonight, some businesses must still stay closed. Bars, nightclubs, amusement parks, live performance venues, and public swimming pools all must stay closed until May 13th. The governor says the rules vary by business for a measured health-driven approach. And it's important to give you some context about where Georgia is standing right now in terms of cases and death. The very latest numbers showing more than 26,000 people have tested positive for the virus. That's up about 20% from last week. More than 1,100 people have died, a 28% increase from last week. The governor says we're seeing cases go up right now because testing has expanded so much in our area. 11 Alive Cheryl Preheim spoke with the governor earlier today about his decision and what Georgians should expect over the next few months. Talk more about your decision to extend the Georgia state of emergency through June 12th and why that's important. Well, you know, I had some conversations with Lieutenant Governor Duncan, Speaker Ralston, and they both agreed that we needed to extend the order. That gives us the ability through the Department of Public Health and other emergency powers to continue uh, all the good work that we've been doing in recent days to ramp up our testing. We've seen you know, a, re a record day this week and really some exponential growth there, and we need to continue to do, to do more. But it also allows me the ability from a waiver perspective dealing with you know, potential outside doctors and nurses from outside the state coming in. 
uh, hospital bed capacity issues. There's just a lot of reasons to extend that uh, to make sure that we can have 100% response to COVID-19 in the state of Georgia. You've talked a lot about extending that hospital bed capacity and also the number of ventilators. Where does that stand and how much has that factored into your decision to go ahead and lift the overall shelter in place? Well, it's a big part of it. I mean, that's, a, that's some of the data that we're following those numbers literally every day. I get an update seven days a week on that. Uh, we had the lowest ventilator use today that, than we've had in a long time. Our hospital bed capacity continues to be in really good shape. Uh, so, you know, and that's really what the, all these uh, previous orders were doing was allowing us time to help flatten the curve and really build up that capacity. And now that we've done that, uh, I felt like it was time for us to move forward. You know, continuing to focus on the, the, the people that are really affected by this, that's those that are in our long-term care facilities, the elderly and the medically fragile but also easing up on the shelter in place for other Georgians because they have done what we asked. They helped us flatten the curve and build that infrastructure out and also you know, get our testing and contract uh, tracing is starting to ramp up as well. People have done what the state has asked for the most part and how important is it now moving forward that people continue making some of those personal decisions about how much they're out or whether they wear a mask? A lot of people just going to have to make day-to-day -day choices about how they move forward. Well, and I think that's really the message I have to people is number one, thank you for helping us flatten the curve and, and have the time to do all of this work and be prepared. But also I feel like it's time to free them up a little bit uh, it's time to get our economy back started. We cannot continue down this road. We're going to have depression-like unemployment if we do, and we're going to have people that are, you know, going crazy trying to get food and medicines for their families. And that's not that's not what we want in this state or what we want in this country. And we're taking a measured step forward to allow that. But we've also got to continue to have our citizens be part of the solution and not part of the problem. We still have the um, so, uh, social distancing requirements in place. We have the large gathering ban in place. We're continuing to keep some establishments closed like bars and nightclubs and entertainment venues. We'll continue to watch the data as we move into phase two about easing up on that. But even though we're freeing people up to move around a little more than they have, we do need them to um, you know, wear a mask if they're going to the grocery store or going to the pharmacy. You know, I've talked to Dr. Toomey about that. That's what she does. But when she goes to the neighborhood park to walk her dog, she's not wearing a mask because she can socially distance herself from people. She's in an open air environment. So we just need people to use that good common sense. And I know our business community, those that decided to open, and that was not a mandate, that was a choice. Uh, they've done a great job of following the guidelines that we have to protect themselves, their employees, as well as their customers. One of the most common questions we're getting is about the numbers people seeing, the number of cases going up. Talk about what you're seeing with the curve and those case numbers. Well, there's a lot of different metrics, Cheryl, that we're following every day. And I know it is kind of counterintuitive to people when they see the number of cases that are going up. That is actually a good thing because it means that we're testing more. But what else is good that we're seeing right now? We're really watching this trend the number of cases, the number of tests are going up, and but the percentage of the positive cases to the number of tests continues to drop. And that's what we want to continue to see. So we're testing more, but the number of positives we're getting, that percentage is dropping. So that is a very good sign. You know, we're not going to get rid of the virus. None of these things that we're doing uh, is designed to get rid of the virus. It's designed for us to be able to have the health care capacity and to meet the needs of any patient in Georgia that, that needs uh, you know, a hospital bed or needs medical attention. That's what you know, the guidelines at the federal level were designed for. We meet those guidelines to move into phase one, so that's what we've done. But we got to continue to make sure that as we're going to see community spread, we don't need it to turn into a hot spot or an epicenter. If people are following these best practices, you know, that's, we're going to continue to see these good numbers that we have as we go forward. 
you know, doctors have said there's so many unknowns. The, the what next is always the big question mark. How much has the state talked through potential next steps as we see the impacts unfold over the next couple of weeks? Well, I continue to be in touch with a lot of our hospital CEOs on the bed capacity issue and actually uh, these discussions about, you know, slowly reopening Georgia's economy. They were a big part of that. They got so many empty hospital beds, they're becoming financially not viable. That is a big concern to them. That's the last thing we need is for our hospitals, you know, to start laying off nurses and doctors and closing their doors because they're not financially viable. Uh, they've, uh, you know, uh, we've given the, sent a signal that they can start some of these elective surgeries back that will put people to work, but also get some good health outcomes for their patients. So, you know, they're in support of those type things. But everybody realizes, and, you know, we're hearing this from certainly from the White House and Dr. Birch and Dr. Fauci, you know, everybody's got their eyes on the fall. Once we kind of get through where we are now here, hopefully the next two or three weeks, next month or so, move into a different phase. You know, we also got to prepare for a, a, a rebound this fall if the virus comes back. You know, who knows what that's going to look like? Who knows if we won't have, you know, medical treatments available? Then there's some promising things out there, um, potentially a, a vaccine. You know, I'm not the expert on that. There's a lot of really smart people working on that issue, and I, I certainly hope and pray that they're successful. But a lot of the things that we're doing, we stood up to be in place for a long time. We knew this wouldn't be over in June. It may be calmed down in June, and life may go back to a relatively, relatively normal format uh, with certainly a, a new world order from social distancing and things of that nature. But we also know that we got to prepare for this to come back in the fall and, and continue to do that, quite honestly, until there is a vaccine or some sort of medical treatment. Just one step at a time, I guess. Governor, thank you so much for the time. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Well, we love to see you sharing the good things that are happening in and around our communities and a family in Fayette County is doing just that. Ethan's family reached out to us to share how he's doing whatever it takes to make an impact. He's heavily involved in local organization and has been the manager of the Stars Mill High School basketball team for 10 years now, more than that. He's worked so hard, so for his 30th birthday, Ethan's family organized a parade and more than 50 cars participated. It was certainly a birthday Ethan will never forget. Remember, you can get in on the action and let us know the good things that are happening around you. Send us your videos, your pictures, and use the hashtag SendTheLoveATL. You can also text them to us at 404-885-7600. We'll be right back. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station.
today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. COVID-19 has been around long enough that we now have survivors to celebrate, but it'll take months, even years, for some to recover from the financial toll of beating this virus. Reveal investigator Rebecca Lindstrom takes a look at the confusion surrounding medical costs. They are the moments that keep hope alive, the cheers and reunions with loved ones. Those doctors and nurses, I mean, they deserve every penny they get. Not only did Bridget Cook survive COVID-19, but so did her father and daughter, who spent 11 days on a ventilator. But Cook herself almost didn't go to the hospital. In my head, I was going, we can't take another bill. We're going to lose our house. You know, how am I going to pay for this? And, and it's a lot. So far, the bill for Cook's care is $18,000. She's waiting to see what her insurance will pay, but she fears it won't be much. I read the other day, it pays like $300 a day for a hospital stay. And I'm like, holy cow. She has no idea what her daughter's care will cost. Hi, Daddy. Richard Pellegrino, a man in Cobb County, was on a ventilator for about a week. His bill? <laughs> it was $199,000 and change. And uh, that... It was surprising because I've never seen that big a bill in my life for anything. 18,000 of that costs associated with two visits to the emergency room where he was turned away without receiving the COVID test. Pellegrino also received an experimental treatment. Yeah, I was uh, offered and accepted uh, the anti-malarial drugs. Which not all health insurance companies have agreed to cover. You literally just described the typical surprise medical bills in the area. Bernetta Hayes with consumer advocacy nonprofit Georgia Watch has a guide to help families navigate the patchwork of promises from insurance providers and the government. While most say they'll cover testing. The treatment aspect of COVID-19 um, health care is where the confusion and some of the surprises will come into play. The federal government has said it will foot the bill for the uninsured and Medicare, which Pellegrino has. Still, his last statement has him on the hook for $38,000. We're, we're living day to day. Just search GoFundMe COVID medical bills, and you will find an almost endless list of families asking for help. Families like Cook, who made the tough decision not to get the inhaler prescribed as part of her COVID recovery. Was like $360. That's a car payment. That's part of our house payment. But Cook says she doesn't regret the decision to go to the hospital. Her husband put it simply. I'd rather pay a hospital bill than a funeral bill for you. And that kind of resonated in my head. From testing to hospital admissions, what are you being asked to pay? We want to hear from you. Email us at COVID-19 medical bills at 11alive.com. Again, that's COVID-19 medical bills at 11alive.com. And if you're wondering what to do next, we've put a link to this resource guide on our webpage.
I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. We had cooler air in place today. In fact, we topped off with below average temperatures in the low and mid 60s in some spots. And that cool air is going to stick with us as we go through the nighttime hours tonight. And then tomorrow, it'll be a cool start, but that cooler air starts to retreat to go back to the north. And that's going to open up the door for this warmer air that is going to move into our area. We'll definitely be feeling that on Saturday. We go back to the lower 80s. And then by Sunday, as that warmer air continues to move in, we're going to be in the mid 80s and we pretty much hold in the mid 80s as we go into the beginning of the week. But then you'll notice here the cooler air from the north trying to spill back down into our area by Wednesday and Thursday. We'll see those temperatures starting to drop again where we go back down into the 70s. So here's the outlook uh, into next week. Uh, this, the uh, Climate Prediction Center showing from May 7th to the 13th below average temperatures that are going to be moving into our area for next week. Our average for next week is around 78 for a high, and we do think we'll be below that heading into next week. Now, tomorrow, we're going to see a, a warm-up moving our way, and we'll wait and see if that has any impact on the pollen count. It was really low, well, low or medium today. Officially, 35 is in the medium range, but I know we all celebrate a, uh, a pollen count that's in the 30s. The main pollens present are hickory, oak, pine, walnut, and mulberry. Grasses are in the moderate range. No issues with grass weeds right now. Um, and mold is back up to the high range, too, if that is one of your allergens. Now, here's what's happening tomorrow. That cool start, but look how we warm up into the 70s. Plenty of sunshine. It is just going to be a beautiful day here for tomorrow. And here's a look at your, your uh, headlines. We're going to see some warming as we head into the weekend with a dry pattern ahead. We're finally going to have an opportunity to dry out a little bit. And then that rain chance is going to be returning next week. But as of right now, it doesn't look like a major event coming in next week. So enjoy your 11 on the wasometer tomorrow, a low of 50, a high of 73 degrees. Forecast track showing tonight. Uh, quiet conditions. We'll see clearing skies. And then as we continue through the day tomorrow, it is going to be a nice day with plenty of sunshine around and uh, temperatures rebounding lower to mid 70s here tomorrow. And then that warm up continues going into Saturday with just a couple little clouds around. Uh, we'll eventually get up into the lower 80s on Saturday and then mid 80s here on Sunday. So here's the seven day outlook where we we see that warm up 73 Friday, 81 Saturday, mid 80s on Sunday. Monday and Tuesday, but you'll notice the rain chance coming back. It's a low rain chance Monday at 20%, then a 30% chance for showers, maybe a couple of thunder showers on Tuesday, going back down to a 20% chance Wednesday. And then after that quick moving system exits, we'll begin to cool down again into the 70s as we get toward the middle and end of next week. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear on 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. 
Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Fever is one of the main symptoms of COVID-19, and it is something that you can test at home with a thermometer. Problem is, there are dozens of thermometers and ways to use them. We had our Verify team look into the best practices to get the best results. Here is Jason Puckett. Search online, and there are lots of thermometers you can buy. So which is best, and how can you get the most accurate results? To find out, we asked Nisa Ernst. She's the nurse manager in endoscopy and biocontainment at John Hopkins Hospital. We have found um, is that this the temporal thermometers actually work the best. Temporal thermometers are a newer type that you place against your forehead to get a reading. It's that fast, too. Yeah, it's that fast. And then you're simply wiping it down with an alcohol wipe and you can take the next employee that's coming in. So they're quick, easily cleaned, and Ernst says they're by far the most accurate. But they are more expensive and not as easy to find. So what about infrared or digital thermometers? They're all over online and in stores. Is that better than nothing? Absolutely. No question. And everybody should have a thermometer like this at home. Ernst says most modern thermometers are pretty accurate, but the infrared and digital ones are more likely to be affected by outside factors like the temperature of the room or sunlight. Still, any thermometer works as long as you test at the right time. Go out and get a basic thermometer and take your basic temperature before you're febrile. The CDC says for most, a fever is temperatures above 100.4 degrees, but some people run hot or cold. So if you test before you have a fever, you can compare that number when you are feeling sick. Even if you're above or below the average, you'll know if the temperature is high for you. So now you've got a thermometer. Where should you test on your body? Ernst says rectal tests are the most accurate, but most people won't do that. Next would be an oral test, and she said ear thermometers are off and off by a few degrees. So bottom line, Ernst highly recommended temporal thermometers, especially for businesses that are looking for a quick and sanitary way to test employees coming back to the office. But she also said any thermometer is better than none. The key is testing before you're feeling sick so you know if your temperature is higher than normal. Oh, and last thing, if you have a glass thermometer. And a simple message is glass thermometer, get rid of it. If you've got more questions, send us an email coverage during prime time we're committed to giving you facts not fear on 11 alive news prime time weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF there are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases wash your hands avoid close contact with people who are sick avoid touching your eyes nose and mouth stay home when you are sick cover your cough or sneeze Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have... Yesterday, the NCAA made a decision that has made it a very real possibility that student athletes can profit off their name, image, and likeness. That means they could be in advertisements or get paid for appearances. But as Alex Glaze tells us, there's still a lot to work out. Alex Glaze here with Jason Sechen. He's an, an attorney that represents college and pro athletes. Jason, when we're, when we're talking about student athletes profiting on their name, image, and likeness. An, an interesting aspect, I think, is going to be that social media aspect oh, and yeah. athletes being able to, to market themselves. When you're looking at this from the NCAA's perspective, what is their problem with this going to be? The fear is that you're going to have somebody that owns five restaurants in the town that's a huge backer of the school and a fan and is going to put some crazy number on the value of that uh, Instagram post and or worse, uh, try and attract kids before they even go to school. Some might say that you're only worth what someone's willing to pay you. So how do you regulate that? Well, that, that's very true. And, and there are a lot of people that feel like student athletes should make as much as they can when they can make it. The NCAA, on the other hand, does not feel that way. So it's going to be kind of a give and a take. The NCAA is going to have to police this and control it to, in order for them to feel comfortable with this process. It will be the Wild West to start, I imagine. The rules will have to be challenged and they'll, they'll, there'll be all sorts of interpretations necessary. And, you know, it's, it's going to be a challenge for compliance offices at every level of the sports world. I mean, it, it will be difficult. But ultimately, I think it's the right thing to do. Kids should be able to make money while they're in college, just like kids that aren't playing sports. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Uh, it's time to get our economy back started. We cannot continue down this road. Georgia's shelter-in-place order expires in six hours. We look at what the governor is asking we all do to keep fighting to flatten the COVID-19 curve. With restrictions loosening, empty city scenes like these may soon be a distant memory. But not all of you welcome the change. What you have to say about it tonight. And Atlanta sending the love, one woman's milestone of a lifetime that has the whole community celebrating. But first tonight, Governor Brian Kemp choosing not to extend the state's shelter in place, which expires at midnight tonight. However, he is still urging people to stay home when possible, saying the fight against coronavirus is, quote, Far from over. We have team coverage tonight, beginning with Jennifer Bellamy breaking down what's still in place and who it affects. The governor made his announcement on Twitter this afternoon. Georgia's main statewide shelter in place order will expire tonight for many of us, but there are still some restrictions in place for certain Georgians. Governor Kemp has extended the shelter in place order for several groups through June 12th, about a month and a half from now. That's for those 65 and older, those living in nursing homes or long term care facilities, and those with pre existing conditions like chronic lung disease, severe heart disease, diabetes, moderate to severe asthma, and severe obesity just to name a few. Now, all of the businesses that reopened last week can continue to operate. That's gyms, barbers and stylists, nail techs, tattoo shops and bowling alleys, along with the dine-in restaurant service and movie theaters. They must still, though, meet previously released sanitary and distancing guidelines. But some businesses are still a no-go. Bars, nightclubs, amusement parks, live performance venues and public swimming pools must remain closed through 11 59 p.m. on May 13th, unless that is extended. The governor says the rules vary by business for a measured health driven approach. The health and well being of Georgians are my top priorities, and my decisions are based on data and advice from health officials. I will do what is necessary to protect the lives and the livelihoods of our people. 
Another thing to know that ban on large gatherings remains in place. Businesses and governments can't allow more than 10 people in a single location unless there's unless there is six feet between them, but that does not include family units or single households. Local county and city leaders are doing their part to keep their community safe amid Governor Kim's decision to allow the shelter in place order to expire tonight. 11 Alive's Ellen Lopez continues our team coverage. I was able to catch up with three community leaders who tell me they were not surprised by Governor Kemp's announcement today. I've always said it's more of an individual decision. Now, he's been in between a rock and a hard place, wanting to do what's best for the health of Georgians, while at the same time, he's concerned about the economy of Georgia. So I think this was another baby step towards getting back to uh, some sense of normalcy. Fulton County Commissioner Rob Pitts says he believes that many Georgians will continue to shelter in place after tonight, including business owners in Fulton County who have yet to open their doors, even though some of them were allowed to reopen last Friday. They're just taking baby steps, I guess, is the way, the best way to describe it. DeKalb County CEO Michael Thurman says he hopes Governor Kemp's decision was the right move, but isn't going to wait to find out. You can't run a county the size of DeKalb with 750,000 people based on hope. We have to also be practical and realize that there's a huge risk associated with reopening the state at this time. This coming weekend, Thurman says they will be distributing thousands of masks and hand sanitizers to residents there now that the shelter in place order will be lifted. We have to do more in reaction to the fact that more people will be out, more people will be interacting with one another and consequently increasing the probability of reigniting uh, this horrible disease. A possible round two of COVID-19 cases is also a concern Athens Mayor Kelly Gertz shares as he continues to encourage his community to stay put. If we don't continue to shelter in place, it means that coming through this might not see just a second wave, but a series of waves of infection. Um, and so I, I want that to be avoided. It's important to give you some context about where Georgia stands as the shelter in place order expires. More than 26,000 people have tested positive for the virus, about a 20% increase since last week. 1,100 people have died. That's up 28% from last week. Now, Governor Kemp told our very own Cheryl Preheim today that Georgia must move forward one step at a time to save lives and the livelihood of all Georgians. But the governor also says that as the testing go up, so will the cases go up as well. But the percentage of people testing positive, according to him, is going down. But we got to continue to make sure that as we're going to see community spread, we don't need it to turn into a hot spot or an epicenter. If people are following these best practices, you know, that's we're going to continue to see these good numbers that we have as we go forward. And the governor says it's really important for all Georgians to stay proactive and to stay safe as we continue to battle this pandemic. He says the virus is not going away and we must be vigilant until there is a treatment or a vaccine. We're going to hear a lot more from that full interview from Cheryl Preheim coming up in the next half hour. Medical experts we have spoken with are also worried Georgia's shelter in place order is expiring too early. Joe Henke explains how we'll be able to gauge if people are still following social distancing guidelines as the order ends. Before Governor Brian Kemp's announcement, top infectious disease experts told us that we would need to wait to see that impact play out. But they said if the shelter in place order expires, that it would be up to all Georgians to continue social distancing and staying at home when possible. Now the shelter in place order is set to expire. And in his announcement himself, Governor Brian Kemp said he still is urging Georgians to stay home as much as possible. I talked to an epidemiologist with Emory University. He said right now he's focused on several Several events that could lead to a spike in cases that includes going back to Easter and Passover when earlier this month families may have come together for the holiday this past Friday when salons, barbershops, bowling alleys and other businesses could open this past Monday when restaurants could open their dining rooms and now the shelter in place expires and tomorrow malls in Georgia including Lenox Square and Phipps Plaza will open. I'm told it could take two to three weeks for these events to possibly lead to spikes in cases. For now doctors are telling us all of the health and safety guidelines you followed under the shelter in place order those remain important. Go out as little as possible you know use a mask wash your hands 
practice social distancing. So the more people do that, the less the spike will occur. 14 day windows is really what we think about um, is our best estimate of, of how long cases can, can really go between when someone gets infected um, and may actually be showing signs of, of disease. And Dr. Robert Benarchek there with Emory University mentioned that 14 day window for someone to go from infection to symptoms. It also takes additional time, he said, for someone then to get tested and for those results to come back. So that's why it could take two, if not up to three weeks, Jeff, before we know the true impact of Georgia's steps so far to reopen. You know, we're hearing from you from all over the state, and you have a lot of opinions about the governor's decision. Should we open? Should we not? 1,500 of you have already uh, have already polled already, already voted, and 75% of you said, no, we should not open. We're moving too fast. 25% say, hey, this is a good deal. This is a good idea. So let us know what you think, folks. Just go to our website, 11alive.com slash vote. We want to be able to hear from you. But this is what other folks are saying about the governor's decision. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Vita McNeil. My name is Kenya. I'm a Cobb County resident. Hi, my name is Linda Edwards. I live in Decatur, Georgia. This is Gregory Brown. I'm in uh, Farron, Georgia. And I really think this is too soon. Way too soon. Hello, my name is Tanya Willis, and I live in Lawrenceville. We've seen how well the quarantine and the shelter in place has worked in other countries. I do not believe the shelter-in-place order should be removed this evening. And Georgia and America in general has just not taken it seriously enough. I do not think it's the proper time to release the shelter-in-place order uh, simply because no questions have been answered properly. My concern about the shelter-in-place expiring tonight is that I haven't heard any numbers that support this. I don't plan on being a part of this first and second wave. I'm going to see how everybody else fares, and if my questions are answered, me and my family will continue, you know, in a new normal. 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks, and we want to hear from you. What do you think about Georgia's shelter-in-place order expiring tonight? Call and leave a message at the number on your screen, 678-765-9514. Be sure you leave your name, your number, and where you live, because we may share your comments on our newscasts. I'm Doug Richards in Gwinnett County, where bus drivers want the company that runs the county transit system to tighten up its rules to reduce the risk of COVID-19. Transit workers have been in talks with Gwinnett, Marta, and Cobb County's transit system. They seek hazard pay, PPE and other safety gear, requiring masks for passengers and paid COVID-19 testing for transit workers, among other things. They're on the front line, but they're dealing with it uh, without having the uh, protected gear to actually help. The union says the transit system's responses have been varied. MARTA has given drivers bonus pay. Science is moving faster in this pandemic than in past ones. That should be encouraging to everyone. An Emory researcher who is part of the clinical trial of the first COVID-19 treatment to show it's helping patients recover faster. That's good news. That researcher says progress is significant. I've been involved in multiple outbreaks in the past and I have not seen the advancement of science go so quickly. And a lot of that is based off of the wonderful new technologies that we have. But also a lot of that is just the wonderful collaboration between people across the world and across the United States that are all really working together, working hard together to get these answers for all of us. Emory University played a leading role in the trial of the COVID-19 drug remdesivir, enrolling 100 patients in Atlanta more than any other site in the world. According to preliminary data, hospitalized patients with advanced COVID-19 in their lungs recovered faster when they took the drug. The trial proves that a drug can block this virus, but more testing is still needed. The FDA still has not officially approved the treatment. Right now, remdesivir is only being used for the sickest patients already in the hospital, and it's an IV form, so don't expect the pill to show up in pharmacies anytime soon. Meanwhile, the Trump administration has launched a new initiative called Operation Warp Speed to push drug makers to develop a coronavirus vaccine by January. For small business owners, a far off dream of economic relief. Next on Prime Time, we're going to check in with one woman still holding out hope to get a portion of the Paycheck Protection Fund. 
We were tracking storms this time last night moving out of the area. Now radar is clean. No rain in our area and even around the southeast. We're watching rain exit, but nothing really coming our way. I'll let you know if this drier pattern and cooler pattern is going to stick around. And thanks for sharing good news with us and the things happening around you. So Atlanta is sending the love and it is a party in Fulton County. Hattie Lucy Young has lived in South Fulton all her life. Last week she turned 100 years old. No party allowed because of social distancing, but still the love and recognition she deserves was given in full display. With sirens blazing, police, city officials, family and friends held a drive by parade. It gave them the opportunity to safely wish Hattie a happy 100th birthday. We are so glad they shared this video with us. And we want to know the good things you're seeing around you. You can send us your videos using the hashtag send love ATL or text them to us at In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day. Welcome back, everyone. Tonight, we have an inside look at the new antibody testing, which could play a key role in opening up the entire country. The tests are becoming more accessible to millions of people. Chief Investigator, Reveal Investigator, Brennan Keith breaks it all down for us tonight. What are antibodies, and why would we want to test for them in a large portion of the population? <laughs> Antibodies are like the building blocks of your immune system, and each one represents a disease to which you've been exposed at some point in your lifetime. That seasonal flu strain from a couple of years ago? Well, your immune system responded by creating just the right antibody to connect with that virus almost like a lock and key, and then made millions of copies of that antibody, destroying the virus, making you feel better, but those antibodies remain in your system. The novel coronavirus is different. Novel simply means new. There isn't a single person on the planet who already had antibodies to this virus last year. And what that means is none of us had the antibodies in the library of our immune system to fight this new virus. That means the body would have to create its own new antibody to see exactly which one would fit with the coronavirus and destroy it. And then once it does, the body makes millions of copies of those antibodies. By testing the blood for the presence of the antibodies, we can tell not only how many people have been infected with the virus, including in the past, but also who may already have immune systems primed to fight reinfection. One beacon of hope, at least for small business owners, is renewed funding for the Paycheck Protection Program. Jennifer Bellamy has a story of one store owner who is holding out hope that she could get a part of that fund. 
For Laura Saunders, it's business from a distance. She owns Inman Park Pet Works, and like many other small businesses, the coronavirus pandemic has taken a major bite out of her operations. We are on average about 50% down in sales. She sells assorted pet food and supplies and offers spa services for her four-legged clientele, but most of that has been kicked to the curb, literally. Saunders is one of the over 30 million small businesses that help power the U.S. economy. Unfortunately, they can also be the most vulnerable during an economic downturn, which is why the Paycheck Protection Program is so coveted. It can provide much-needed financial relief, except for Saunders, that relief seems like a far-off dream. I did it online. Um, I, I got all the necessary documents that they needed. They reviewed that and then they went to the next step and unfortunately all the funds were already depleted. The nearly $350 billion worth of initial emergency relief funds ran out in a matter of two weeks. Some of it snapped up by publicly traded companies and many small business owners felt they were at an unfair disadvantage. It's kind of a first come first serve thing. Eric Wilson is vice president at Citizens Trust Bank, one of the oldest and largest black owned banks in the nation. You've got five employees and you're ahead of somebody that has, you know, 250, we're going to process that in the, in the order that it comes. Wilson says when it comes to the Paycheck Protection Program, time is of the essence, and working with a bank that knows you can make all the difference. Even before we knew how we were going to process our applications, we kind of reached out to, you know, some of the people that have been loyal customers to us, and we said, hey, this is coming down the pipe. You know, you got you might want to get your ducks in a row. Round two of the payment protection program kicked off earlier this week, and Saunders wonders if she'll strike pay dirt this time around. I don't know where in the queue I am. I mean, there could be a million applications ahead of me, and it'll deplete what was funded. Saunders says it's a waiting game, and fiscally speaking, time is not on her side. Fortunately, the landlord is helping us out with the rent here, so that's giving us a bit of a break. But. You know, and it, it, I just have to rely on some of my personal savings account to keep our staff on and to keep the doors open. Well, right now, hold on. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers, and, and we're real excited that we have a quiet night tonight. And if you're watching us on TV, you may be wondering, what is this phone doing up here in the shot? That's because I'm also doing a Facebook Live. We have about just under 200 people. We were over 300 earlier, now just under 200 people. Um, like Connie Lee from, uh, is from Gainesville, she says hello. Uh, Dennis Carty says, looking forward to good running weather. That's good to know. And... Um, April Davis is saying, have a great night. So a lot of comments coming on. So if you want to be a part of this conversation, just go to my Facebook page, Chris Holcomb 11 Alive, and you can ask some questions as well. So let's take a break here from Facebook. And the Facebook uh, folks on Facebook are watching as I'm doing this forecast as well. And, you know, a lot quieter tonight than what we were dealing with last night, where we don't have any rain around, no storms. In fact, looking around the southeast, you can see that storm system has moved well off uh, into the Atlantic. A little wraparound moisture on the backside. That kind of kicked up a couple of sprinkles over parts of far north Georgia earlier today, but most of us were staying dry. I'm sure the thing that all of you have noticed, though, today, and we told you about it yesterday, is that it was going to be a lot cooler today. We only got up to 63 degrees for a high temperature this afternoon, and now we're into the 50s. So if you've been out tonight, I'm sure you noticed on that walk or taking out the trash or taking the dog out, that it, it's cooling down, right? In the 50s now. Duluth, you're still in the lower 60s, but mostly everybody else is in the 50s. And we're going to continue to watch these temperatures falling as we go through the rest of the nighttime hours. And you can see us moving down into those low 50s. Now, I think the upper 40s are going to be more for the outlying areas. I think here in the city, we will stay right there in the low 50s. In fact, I'm going 50 for a low in the morning and then a high of 73. I'm still going to go with an 11 on the wasometer, even though these temperatures are just a little bit lower than what we should be for this time of year. But we're going to have plenty of sunshine, crystal clear day, great visibility. It's just going to be a nice feel to the air out there. So um, we rate your weather on a scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. And that's what we're doing. It's going to be an 11 alive day tomorrow. So here's a look at the forecast track where we have dry conditions out there tonight. And, you know, those clouds today were a little stubborn to break up, but they are clearing now and we'll continue to see clearing skies tomorrow. And that's going to give us more sunshine here during the day. And temperatures will start to rebound where we were only in the at 63 for a high today. I think we'll be 10 degrees warmer tomorrow with a high of 73. 
with that sunshine around on Saturday, mostly sunny skies, maybe just a couple of clouds here and there, but a really good day Saturday. And that warm up is going to continue going into Saturday as well. So here's a look at that seven day outlook where it's going to be a beautiful day tomorrow. Highs near 73. Watch this warming trend, though. We go up to 81 Saturday, mid 80s Sunday, Monday and Tuesday with a mix of sun and clouds. You'll see here the rain chance, a low chance um, Monday at 20%. I think that's more to the north. A 30% chance for showers on Tuesday, maybe some thunder with that. And then on Wednesday, going back down to 20% and then clearing out again on Thursday and Friday. And those temperatures after we're in the mid 80s for this weekend, they will trend back down into the 70s for the middle and end of next week. All right, those magnificent men in their flying machines, the Navy's Blue Angels and the Air Force Thunderbirds flew information over New York City earlier this week to honor coronavirus essential workers. This weekend, they're bringing their aerial shout out to Atlanta as part of Operation America Strong. Here's what that looks like from inside the Jets cockpits. The Thunderbirds were founded in 1953 and the Blue Angels in 1946 in the wake of World War II. And now they're taking to the skies over cities across the country to salute those on the front lines of the pandemic. The pilots will show off their precision flying skills over Atlanta on Saturday, starting at 1.35 p.m. The show will last about 25 minutes. They will release their exact route tomorrow, so check 11alive.com for the best time to look up. Next on Primetime, it's the White House really selling commemorative COVID-19 coins. Our verified team will have that story coming up after the break. Diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. The Verify team is here to get the facts and dispel misinformation online. Like these tweets that claim that the White House is selling commemorative coins for COVID-19 sparking outrage for many. So let's verify, is it the White House that's selling these coins? We tracked the coins down to this site, whitehousegiftshop.com. And that's our first clue. A government-run website would be .gov, not .com. Although it's no surprise that some are confused. With a seal in the corner, photos of the White House, and a similar color scheme, it looks a lot like the official White House page. 
The Verify team spoke with the CEO of the gift shop, Tony Giannini, via email. It turns out a variation of this shop has been around since 1946 and was once located in the White House basement. But Giannini confirmed that's not the case anymore. His company, Giannini Strategic LLC, took over operations in 2012. And it's clearly written right on their website, no government funds or resources are ever used in the operations of the shop. So we can verify, false. The White House is not selling COVID-19 commemorative coins. It's a private company. By the way, Giannini tells me they've already sold nearly a thousand of those coins, netting about $100,000. He says he's gonna personally match every dollar with all the money going to the CDC Foundation and the Johns Hopkins Kimmel Cancer Center. With your Verify, this is Evan Kozlov. Newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Midnight, Georgia's shelter in place order will expire. Governor Kim choosing not to renew it, but still urging all people to stay home as much as possible and practice strict social distancing guidelines. He also says at risk groups should continue to shelter in place until June 12th. That's for people 65 and older, those living in nursing homes or long term care facilities, and those with pre existing conditions like chronic lung disease, severe heart disease, diabetes, moderate to severe asthma and severe obesity, to name a few. And even with the shelter in place order ending tonight, some businesses must still stay closed. Bars, nightclubs, amusement parks, live performance venues and public swimming pools all must stay closed through May 13. The governor says the rules vary by business for a measured health driven approach. It's important to give you some context about where Georgia stands right now in terms of cases and deaths. The latest numbers show 
More than 26,000 people have tested positive for the virus. That is up about 20% from last week. More than 1,100 people have died, a 28% increase from just last week. The governor says we're seeing cases go up right now because testing has expanded so much in our area. 11 Alive Cheryl Preheim spoke with Governor Kemp earlier today at length about his decision and what Georgians should expect over the next few months. Talk more about your decision to extend the Georgia state of emergency through June 12th and why that's important. Well, you know, I had some conversations with Lieutenant Governor Duncan, Speaker Ralston, and they both agreed that we needed to extend the order. That gives us the ability through the Department of Public Health and other emergency powers to continue uh, all the good work that we've been doing in recent days to ramp up our testing. We've seen, you know, a, re a record day this week and really some exponential growth there, and we need to continue to, to do more. But it also allows me the ability from a waiver perspective dealing with you know potential outside doctors and nurses from outside the state coming in a hospital bed capacity issues there's just a lot of reasons to extend that uh, to make sure that we can have a hundred percent response to COVID-19 in the state of Georgia. You've talked a lot about extending that hospital bed capacity and also the number of ventilators. Where does that stand and how much has that factored into your decision to go ahead and lift the overall shelter in place? Well, it's a big part of it. I mean, that's, a, that's some of the data that we're following those numbers literally every day. I get an update seven days a week on that. Uh, we had the lowest ventilator use today that, than we've had in a long time. Our hospital bed capacity continues to be in really good shape uh, so you know and that's really what the all these d uh, previous orders were doing was allowing us time to help flatten the curve and really build up that capacity and now that we've done that uh, i felt like it was time for us to move forward you know continuing to focus on the the, the people that are really affected by this that's those that are in our long-term care facilities the elderly and the medically fragile but also easing up on the shelter in place for other Georgians because they have done what we asked. They helped us flatten the curve and build that infrastructure out and also, you know, get our testing and contract uh, tracing is starting to ramp up as well. People have done what the state has asked for the most part and how important is it now moving forward that people continue making some of those personal decisions about how much they're out or whether they wear a mask. A lot of people just going to have to make day to day choices about how they move forward. Well, and I think that's really the message I have to people is number one, thank you for helping us flatten the curve and, and have the time to do all of this work and be prepared. But also, I feel like it's time to free them up a little bit. Uh, it's time to get our economy back started. We cannot continue down this road. We're going to have depression-like unemployment if we do, and we're going to have people that are, you know, going crazy trying to get food and medicines for their families. And that's not that's not what we want in this state or what we want in this country. And we're taking a measured step forward to allow that. But we've also got to continue to have our citizens be part of the solution and not part of the problem. We still have the um, so, uh, social distancing requirements in place. We have the large gathering ban in place. We're continuing to keep some establishments closed like bars and nightclubs and entertainment venues. We'll continue to watch the data as we move into phase two about easing up on that. But even though we're freeing people up to move around a little more than they have, we do need them to um, you know, wear a mask if they're going to the grocery store or going to the pharmacy. You know, I've talked to Dr. Timmy about that. That's what she does. But when she goes to the neighborhood park to walk her dog, she's not wearing a mask because she can socially distance herself from people. She's in an open air environment. So we just need people to use that good common sense. And I know our business community, those that decided to open, and that was not a mandate, that was a choice. Uh, they've done a great job of following the guidelines that we have to protect themselves, their employees, as well as their customers. One of the most common questions we're getting is about the numbers people seeing, the number of cases going up. Talk about what you're seeing with the curve and those case numbers. Well, there's a lot of different metrics, Cheryl, that we're following every day. And I know it, 
is kind of counterintuitive to people when they see the number of cases that are going up. That is actually a good thing because it means that we're testing more. But what else is good that we're seeing right now? We're really watching this trend. The number of cases, the number of tests are going up, and but the percentage of the positive cases to the number of tests continues to drop. And that's what we want to continue to see. So we're testing more, but the number of positives we're getting, that percentage is dropping. So that is a very good sign. You know, we're not going to get rid of the virus. None of these things that we're doing uh, is designed to get rid of the virus. It's designed for us to be able to have the health care capacity and to meet the needs of any patient in Georgia that, that needs, uh, you know, a hospital bed or needs medical attention. That's what, you know, the guidelines at the federal level were designed for. We meet those guidelines to move into phase one, so that's what we've done. But we got to continue to make sure that as we're going to see community spread, we don't need it to turn into a hot spot or an epicenter. If people are following these best practices, you know, that's we're going to continue to see these good numbers that we have as we go forward. You know, doctors have said there's so many unknowns. The, the what next is always the big question mark. How much has the state talked through potential next steps as we see the impacts unfold over the next couple of weeks? Well, I continue to be in touch with a lot of our hospital CEOs on the bed capacity issue and actually uh, these discussions about, you know, slowly reopening Georgia's economy. They were a big part of that. They got so many empty hospital beds they're becoming financially not viable. That is a big concern to them. That's the last thing we need is for our hospitals, you know, to start laying off nurses and doctors and closing their doors because they're not financially viable. Uh, they've, uh, you know, uh, we've given the, sent a signal that they can start some of these elective surgeries back that'll put people to work, but also get some good health outcomes for their patients. So, you know, they're in support of those type things. But everybody realizes, and you know, we're hearing this from certainly from the White House and Dr. Birch and Dr. Fauci. You know, everybody's got their eyes on the fall. Once we kind of get through where we are now here, hopefully the next two or three weeks, next month or so, move into a different phase. You know, we also got to prepare for a, a, a rebound this fall if the virus comes back. You know, who knows what that's going to look like? Who knows if we won't have you know, medical treatments available, then there's some promising things out there, um, potentially a, a vaccine. You know, I'm not the expert on that. There's a lot of really smart people working on that issue, and I, I certainly hope and pray that they're successful. But a lot of the things that we're doing, we stood up to be in place for a long time. We knew this wouldn't be over in June. It may be calmed down in June, and life may go back to a relatively, relatively normal format. Uh, with certainly a, a new world order from social distancing and things of that nature. But we also know that we got to prepare for this to come back in the fall and, and continue to do that, quite honestly, until there is a vaccine or some sort of medical treatment. Just one step at a time, I guess. Governor, thank you so much for the time. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. All right, switching gears right now. Good news for you Braves fans out there if you purchased some season tickets. You know, at first, Major League Baseball said that they were not going to refund any of the games not played in April and May. Well, all of that is changing for obvious reasons, right? Because they're not going to see all of the full slate of games this season. And there is a possibility games will be played without fans. So MLB told the teams they can determine their own refund policies. The Braves sent letters to those season ticket holders saying they can either be refunded the value of their tickets from April and May or receive credit towards future payments and tickets. Single game ticket holders will have a similar option. Well, the idea of fanless events seems to be constant among many professional sports right now. President Trump shared his thoughts today on sports returning, saying he wants to see stands full of fans once it is safe. If I watch Alabama play LSU, I don't want to see 20,000 people instead of 120,000 people. We want it to be the way it was. Now, we've got to wait till it's gone, and it will be gone. And we've done a lot to get rid of it. Uh, 
but we, we want to open our country. The people want this country open. All right, coming up, the struggle to stay open is a reality for many Georgia businesses right now. Next on Primetime, how help from the government is making sure Atlanta families can still get free medical care. Dry air in place right now, indicated by the blue and purple colors that you see here on the map. And we have a dry pattern ahead, at least for the next few days. But eventually, yeah, some moisture is going to return. I'll let you know what that means for your forecast coming up. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their Well, as you can imagine, there are countless Metro Atlanta small business owners still trying to get a piece of that $310 billion Paycheck Protection Loan Program. 11 Allies Bill List has more on how it saved one key health care center on Atlanta's West End. For the Family Health Centers of Georgia, serving low-income and indigent patients on the city's West End, getting an SBA loan was critical to its survival. We would have been struggling to uh, meet payroll and we would have been struggling with other financial obligations. With a staff of 120 employees, the president and CEO of Family Health, Dr. Michael Brooks, says the more than $1 million he got after not getting anything in the first round is critical to one of the core missions of the center. We're seeing patients who are unemployed and uninsured. We, we see them all. We don't refuse care to anyone. And one of those patients is Ebony Winsonant. She's a single mother of two. She's been living in Atlanta's West End for 21 years, and she relies on the clinic for all of her medical needs. It is very important to me because, like, if I'm a low-income low family, I needed it, it's convenient, and if they wouldn't have got funded, my children wouldn't have got the services that they needed. What would you have done then? Nothing. I just 
being out in the streets. Another key role of the family health clinics is offering free COVID-19 testing, which they've been doing now for more than a month. They say the loan will keep that going. And the president of the African-American-owned Unity National Bank, George Andrews, is helping make sure that Family Health and other small business owners are properly submitting their SBA loan applications to ensure they're getting the money that they so desperately need. We have submitted over 100 applications and 25 have been approved, representing somewhere in the neighborhood of five to $10 million. All of that money, says Andrews, is what's keeping small businesses alive on Atlanta's West End. Without it, Andrew says, many mom and pop stores and restaurants will be forced to close permanently. Fever is one of the main symptoms of COVID-19, and it's something you can test at home with a thermometer. Problem is, there are dozens of thermometers and ways to use them. We had our Verify team look into the best practices to get the best results. Here's Jason Puckett. Search online and there are lots of thermometers you can buy. So which is best and how can you get the most accurate results? To find out, we asked Nisa Ernst. She's the nurse manager in endoscopy and biocontainment at John Hopkins Hospital. We have found um, is that this the temporal thermometers actually work the best. Temporal thermometers are a newer type that you place against your forehead to get a reading. It's that fast too. Yeah, it's that fast. And then you're simply wiping it down with an alcohol wipe and you can take the next employee that's coming in. So they're quick, easily cleaned, and Ernst says they're by far the most accurate. But they are more expensive and not as easy to find. So what about infrared or digital thermometers? They're all over online and in stores. Is that better than nothing? Absolutely. No question. And everybody should have a thermometer like this at home. Ernst says most modern thermometers are pretty accurate, but the infrared and digital ones are more likely to be affected by outside factors like the temperature of the room or sunlight. Still, any thermometer works as long as you test at the right time. Go out and get a basic thermometer and take your basic temperature before you're febrile. The CDC says for most, a fever is temperatures above 100.4 degrees, but some people run hot or cold. So if you test before you have a fever, you can compare that number when you are feeling sick. Even if you're above or below the average, you'll know if the temperature is high for you. So now you've got a thermometer. Where should you test on your body? Ernst says rectal tests are the most accurate, but most people won't do that. Next would be an oral test, and she said ear thermometers are off and off by a few degrees. So bottom line, Ernst highly recommended temporal thermometers, especially for businesses that are looking for a quick and sanitary way to test employees coming back to the office. But she also said any thermometer is better than none. The key is testing before you're feeling sick so you know if your temperature is higher than normal. Oh, and last thing, if you have a glass thermometer. And a simple message is glass thermometer, get rid of it. If you've got more questions, send us an email. Well, today we had improving weather. We started off with sun and then the clouds filled back in. As we were telling you yesterday, it would be a while before those clouds totally moved away today. We were able to see some sunshine breaking through a little bit more later in the afternoon. And now we're clearing and the pollen count today was not bad at all. Only 35 is the pollen count. Remember at the beginning of the month and the end of March, we were talking about that pollen count that was in the 8,000s. So yes, those numbers are coming down. But still, if you are allergic to hickory, oak, pine, walnut, and mulberry, you might be feeling this 35 pollen count versus when it was in the 8,000s because maybe one of these is your allergen. Grass uh, pollens are moderate. We don't have any issues with weed pollen right now. And the mold is back up to the high range at this hour too. So, so you might be dealing with some mold issues as well if that's one of your allergens. We've updated our high for today. Earlier, we were reporting 62, but it went up to 63. So this is the official high for the day. But look at this. We should be around 76 for this time of year. So that's 13 degrees below average. And you felt it out there. It felt cooler than what it should be. And our low this morning was 53, three degrees below the average too. And we still have that surplus more than 14 inches above where we should be in rainfall. So we really are due a nice dry spell. We can afford it <laughs> to have a dry spell here with that surplus like that. Now you can see the cooler temperatures we're dealing with right now, 57 here in town. Duluth, you're still holding in the lower 60s. Everybody else is in those 50s and even some low 50s around like Covington, Carrollton, LaGrange, low 50s, low 50s also up in the mountains of North Georgia. So I know tomorrow's Friday 
And I know you've been working inside, uh, working from home. You've been trying to help your kids with homeschooling. So we always try to give you an opportunity or an excuse to get outside and enjoy it a little bit. And if you want to head out tomorrow morning for a mid-morning recess with the kids as part of their curriculum, you know, you know, they, they have to get out and rest, right? Get out and get some exercise. If you go out at 10 in the morning, it's still going to be a little cool with temperatures around 57 degrees, but sunny skies and dry. Uh, backyard lunch would be good. It is going to be warming up a little bit more. We'll be at 64 degrees by noontime. And then in the afternoon, just, just go ahead and clock out early from, from working from home. Head outside. It's going to be sunny at 4 o'clock for that early clock out with those temperatures about 10 degrees warmer tomorrow than we had out there for today. So here's a look at our headlines. We're going to see even warmer air coming in for the weekend. A dry pattern is ahead. That's going to be nice to have an opportunity to dry out. But then the rain chance returns as we head into next week. So tomorrow, an 11 on the wasometer, low of 50, a high of 73 degrees. It's going to be looking really nice out there. Forecast track showing nothing major moving in. High pressure builds in, and that gives us a nice, quiet, dry pattern with warmer air on the way. 73 Friday, 81 Saturday, mid-80s Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, with the rain chance low, 20% Monday, 30% Tuesday, back to 20% Wednesday, and then cooling back down as we dry out for the middle and end of the week with temperatures back to the 70s. Five uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. spread fast, right? So many of you sent in pictures of your kids' chalk creations after we shared the story of a family in Swanee and their amazing art. They never expected such a big reaction. There is never a dull moment as long as there's some chalk, room on the driveway, and time together. The Tucker family in Swanee, Georgia has been busy dreaming of adventures for Charlotte while they're all home together. It's really just been kind of a fun adventure to see what we can create that day. 
Family time shared by tens of thousands of people now on Facebook. More than I ever thought possible. It was not the intention. We just kind of went with it. Since we introduced you to the Tuckers, we've heard from other families inspired to give it a try too. Toddler slam dunks, little sister skateboarding, and lots of balloons carrying kids away as the creativity catches on. Passing on positivity, prayers, and plenty of thank yous. We're going to see a, a really nice day tomorrow. It's going to be a cool start with temperatures uh, right around 50. Then we get up to 73 in the afternoon. Then the warming trend continues through the period. We're talking lower 80s Saturday, mid 80s through the weekend with a lower rain chance next week. All right, thanks, Chris. Well, we'll see you on Up Late over on 11 Alive at 11 p.m. For now, prime time rose on. touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcast. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Georgia's shelter in place expiring at midnight tonight, but it's not going to be life as usual. We are breaking down the restrictions that will still be in place even after the order ends. And an Oscar award winning actor is teaming up with an Atlanta organization to bring free testing to the area. Atlanta sending the love tonight. One woman's milestone of a lifetime that has her community celebrating. Tonight on this Thursday, Governor Kemp will not extend the state shelter in place order, which is set to expire in about two hours. But the governor says restrictions will remain in place for many, even with the stay at home order ending. Here's John Sherrick. 
It's not as if we'll be going from this back to this overnight, at least not in Governor Kemp's plan However, that he announced on forward, Twitter. I'm urging Georgians to continue to stay home whenever possible. The fight is far from over. We still have the um, social distancing requirements in place. Governor Kemp telling 11 Alive Cheryl Preheim the data supports letting the stay-at-home order expire for most Georgians. We're testing more but the number of positives we're getting, that percentage is dropping. So that is a very good sign. Here's who must still shelter in place until June 12th. People 65 and older, people in long-term care facilities, people with moderate to severe asthma and other pre-existing conditions and chronic illnesses. This is too soon. State Representative William Bodie, speaking for the Democratic Party of Georgia, believes loosening restrictions now will lead to worse later. Lies will be lost. And also the economy of the state of Georgia may not be able to rebound from having another outbreak. Governor Kemp certain the state is moving forward as safely as possible. We knew this wouldn't be over in June, but we also know that we got to prepare for this to come back in the fall and, and continue to do that quite honestly until there is a vaccine or some sort of medical treatment. Governor Kemp also extended the declaration of state public health and the emergency until June 12th. And, and John, can you talk about the reason for that? Well, he thought that extending the emergency order another month would empower him to continue to increase hospital capacity and testing capacity and contact tracing capacity. And he said it also empowers him to react quickly in case something might happen unexpectedly. John Sherrick reporting for us tonight with the facts and the details of Stay in Shelter. John, thank you. With the state shelter in place order expiring, much of the burden for enforcing social distancing now falls to city and county leaders. Athens, Clark County took some of the earliest, most strict steps to keep people at home. We reached out to Mayor Kelly Gertz for his reaction to the governor's decision. If we don't continue to shelter in place, it means that coming through this might not see just a second wave, but a series of waves of infection. Um, and so I, I want that to be avoided. DeKalb County CEO Michael Thurman says he hopes Governor Kim's decision was the right move, but isn't going to wait to find out. Over the weekend, Thurman says they will be distributing thousands of masks and hand sanitizers to residents there now that the shelter in place order will be lifted. We have to do more in reaction to the fact that more people will be out, more people will be interacting with one another and consequently increasing the probability of reigniting uh, this horrible disease. I'm Letitia Lance. With the expiration of the statewide shelter in place order, we've received a lot of questions about what will be open and what will stay closed. So here's all the facts you need to know. All the businesses that reopened over the last week will stay open. That includes gyms, barbers, hair and nail salons, tattoo shops, and bowling alleys. Diamond restaurant service and movie theaters can also continue to operate. A handful of businesses will remain closed through 11.59 p.m. on May 13th. That includes bars, nightclubs, amusement parks, live performance venues, and public swimming pools. The ban on large gatherings still in effect. No more than 10 people are allowed to gather at a single location unless everyone is six feet apart. So you can't overlook how the pressure to improve the economy has played in this decision as to whether to reopen. Governor Kemp has been adamant that Georgia must get back to work. So with many of you struggling to pay your bills and certainly put food on the table for your family, this is an issue that has been one that has been at the forefront since mid-March. The State Department of Labor says it has paid out $388 million in unemployment benefits. And it is draining the state's trust fund, which is almost down by about 20%. Last week, the state processed more than 265,000 new claims. And those details tonight are included in this. Macy's now one of the first major department stores to say it's ready to reopen in Georgia. CNBC reporting it will open several stores on Monday. Several shopping centers also set to open on, on a Friday. That includes Lenox Square, Phipps Plaza, and the Mall of Georgia. Science is moving faster in this pandemic than in past ones. That should encourage everyone. An Emory researcher who is part of the clinical trial of the first COVID-19 treatment to show it's helping patients recover faster says progress is significant. 
I've been involved in multiple outbreaks in the past, and I have not seen the advancement of science go so quickly. And a lot of that is based off of the wonderful new technologies that we have, but also a lot of that is just the wonderful collaboration between people across the world and across the United States that are all really working together, working hard together to get these answers for all of us. Emory University played a leading role in the trial of the COVID-19 drug remdesivir, enrolling 100 patients in Atlanta, more than any other site in the world. According to preliminary data, hospitalized patients with advanced COVID-19 in their lungs recover faster when they took the drug. The trial proves that a drug can block the virus, but more testing is still needed. The FDA still has not officially approved the treatment, so right now remdesivir is only being used for the sickest patients already in the hospital, and it's in IV form, so don't expect the pill to show up in pharmacies anytime soon. Meanwhile, the Trump administration has launched a new initiative. It's called Operation Warp Speed to push drug makers to develop a coronavirus vaccine by January. An Oscar winning actor now teaming up with an Atlanta institution to try to bring free COVID-19 tests to the area. As Ryan Kruger shows us, it is part of a nationwide effort to try to try and flatten the curve. At a place normally reserved for tailgates and celebrations, it's now the site of free COVID-19 testing. The volunteers here in Atlanta um, are an, a, a really promising, exciting group of willful, motivated uh, smart people. Academy Award winning actor Sean Penn's foundation, CORE, has teamed up with the Arthur Blank Foundation to offer free testing at the Home Depot backyard right next to Mercedes-Benz Stadium. When you think about the disproportionate impact that uh, this crisis is having on communities of color and the emphasis we have on the west side, for us it was a clear uh, mandate. Penn founded CORE 10 years ago to help rebuild Haiti after a devastating earthquake. Earlier this month, the organization launched testing sites in California, but has now expanded to other cities, including Atlanta. They show you how to administer it in, in your car with the window up, and then you just drop it in the basket before you leave, so the whole test is done on site. Free tests will be offered to those who have symptoms, along with the high risk and elderly. It's a celebration of citizenship, the citizenship of the volunteers, the citizenship of the community. We have more information on how to get tested outside the stadium on 11alive.com. And Ryan, this is not the first time that Sean Penn's nonprofit has been here in Georgia. Yeah, exactly, uh, Jeff. Just a couple of weeks ago, his organization, CORE, donated $45,000 to organizations in Savannah to help with the response. Uh, that money went to uh, people who are homeless, people with disabilities, and the elderly. All right, Ryan Kruger, thank you on uh, news from uh, the stadium and Sean Penn. Well, we'd love to see all the good things happening in your community. Atlanta is certainly sending the love. Check out this party in Fulton County. Hattie Lucy Young has lived in South Fulton all her life. Last week, she turned 100 years old. Social distancing prevented her from having a big shebang. But that didn't stop her family from planning something really special. We're talking about sirens blazing, police, city officials, family and friends. They did a nice drive-by parade. It gave them the opportunity to wish Hattie a happy 100th birthday from a safe distance. And we would love to see the good things happening around you. Send them to us using the hashtag SendTheLoveATL. Ahead tonight, essential workers continuing to fight for safer conditions. What Gwinnett's transportation workers say they need to feel safe. Well, I know you felt that northwest wind today, and I know you felt that cooler air in place. It is going to remain cool in the morning, but look at this. The warmer air out to the west, it's moving our way. Stay with us. We'll let you know just how warm it's going to get as we head into the weekend. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station.
today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Gwinnett County's transit system is taking steps to make buses safer, but issues remain at transit systems around Metro Atlanta. 11 Alive's Doug Richards has more on what's at stake. Gwinnett County buses have limited the number of passengers on each bus and implemented other steps to reduce COVID-19 exposure. That's a risk for both passengers and bus operators. Operators represented by the Amalgamated Transit Union have been in talks with Gwinnett, MARTA, and Cobb County's bus systems to lower those risks. The union has asked for hazard pay, PPE, and other safety gear, requiring masks for passengers, and paid COVID-19 testing for transit workers, among other things. What we're looking for, in addition, what we're looking for is pandemic leave um, protection. Brett Dunham's is the local union president. We need something that um, if they need to take off for this COVID-19, it will actually protect them as far as their wages and the benefits. The company that operates Gwinnett County's bus system says some of those requests have been addressed and that drivers are still getting paid full time while working fewer hours during the state of emergency. The health and safety of our employees and the community we serve remains our top priority at all times. TransDev and Gwinnett County Transit have been closely collaborating to address the emerging situation. The company operating Gwinnett Transit told us in a statement. A little bit of a chilly day. Temperatures dropping even more tonight. They'll warm up nicely for the weekend. We're complaining about the chill in the air, but by the time we get to the weekend, we'll be talking about the blast <laughs> furnace, which is right down the road. I know. It'll be like, wait, we're sweating now. What's right. up with that? And we were <laughs> complaining about the cooler air here today. Yeah, we were below average today. Our high temperature was 63 degrees. We should be around 76 this time of year. So we're about 13 degrees below the average. The good thing is we don't have any rain around. You know, this time last night we were watching the last bit of the rain as it was coming through the state and exiting our area. And then that northwest wind kicked in, and that's what's been bringing in that cooler air. And yeah, it was kind of breezy today, but those winds are dying down now. But the cooler air is in place for overnight and in the morning. No rain. Uh, there's that storm system that moved out into the Atlantic. A little bit of wraparound moisture to the north. No issues with that. That's just that last bit of that cloud cover that continues to break up tonight. Look at these temperatures. We're in the 50s now at 56 degrees. It is uh, cool out there tonight, and it will get cooler through the overnight hours. We're going to drop down into the low 50s, and even some folks outside the city will wake up in the morning to temperatures in the 40s. So you're going to wake up. It's going to be chilly out there. We're going to have clear skies, a lot of sunshine around to start the day. But through the day, these temperatures will warm up quickly. It'll go from 50 degrees at 8 o'clock in the morning to 58 by 10 and then continue to rise, eventually making it into the 70s for a high tomorrow, right there at 73 degrees. Folks, we're going to have a lot of sunshine. Uh, it's going to be crystal clear skies, great visibility. It's just going to be a beautiful day. And, and we're going to go ahead and give it an 11 on the wasometer. That's our scale from 1 to 11. Uh, where we rate your weather and an 11 is a perfect day and we're going to go with that tomorrow even though those temperatures might be a little tad below where we should be for this time of year now the forecast track showing very quiet weather through tomorrow morning in the afternoon plenty of sunshine around and then it's just going to take a while with that sunshine for those temperatures to rebound and we will get back into the 70s and then heading into saturday a couple of clouds may mix in at times with the sunshine. We're still going to go with mostly sunny skies and even warmer air coming in on Saturday. We get into the lower 80s and then it keeps on going into the mid 80s here by Sunday. So with mostly sunny skies on Saturday, it's going to be looking really nice. And you know we have a special event going on on Saturday in Atlanta 
where the uh, Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds are going to do a special flyover. We don't know the flight path yet. That is supposed to be released tomorrow. All we know is it should be around 1.35 tomorrow where the uh, it's going to be so cool to see these flying over the city. And temperatures at that time are going to be in the 70s and we'll have plenty of sunshine. So it's going to be great visibility. So we'll just wait to see exactly where uh, those jets are going to be flying on Saturday. Take a look now with the forecast track, how we or the European model showing how as we get into Sunday, another good day with the mix of sun and clouds Monday. We reintroduced some scattered showers, but I really think those chances will be higher over North Georgia and lower here in Metro Atlanta on Monday. But then on Tuesday, this system rolls in. That'll give us a chance for some showers. At this point, it doesn't look like it's going to be really that strong of a system, but it's something we're going to be watching over the next few days. So here's a look at what we're watching for your Friday. Highs near 73 and then 81 Saturday. So look at this warming trend and then 85 Sunday holding in the mid 80s Monday and Tuesday. But we'll also see a little more moisture coming in. 20% chance for a shower Monday, 30% Tuesday, back to 20% Wednesday. And then we clear out for Thursday with those temperatures dropping back into the 70s. Take a look at your weather wow moment. And this actually comes from last night from some of those showers that we had. Carol Carmichael in Carrollton uh, with the uh, yeah, th these are the storms that rolled through last night with some of that heavy rain. We'd love to see your weather wow moments. It really helps us tell the weather story. And uh, the way that we do that is a lot of times we get those from our 11 Alive Storm Trackers page. You can become a member of that page. All you have to do is on Facebook in the search bar at the top, just search 11 Alive Storm Trackers, ask to become a member, and you can be a part of that exclusive local weather community. Connection is coming in all kinds of ways. To Cobb County we go where John Racino's idea is a gift friends and one that the family will treasure. Mr. Racino is a lucky man. He is the husband of Jill Becker. You bet. A longtime part of the 11 Alive family, one of the great anchors ever in Atlanta. And he is a talented photographer. His granddaughters love birds, so John started taking pictures. In the middle of March, when we were asked to shelter in place, it stopped my two granddaughters from coming visit me. And they would love to come to our house and look for birds. They love birds. And so what I started doing was I started shooting pictures of the birds outside my, from my window out and sending them the pictures so they could still see the birds at our house. It's unfair. Some men get it all in life. John's one of those guys. His project was only supposed to be something for Facebook, but it turned into a scrapbook for his granddaughters filled with memories that will last a very, very long time in their lives. Oh my gosh, those faces. <laughs> Heart That's just skipped a beat. Well, after 30 days in ICU fighting COVID-19, a Metro Atlanta man has finally been released from the hospital. His story of survival next. Household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, 
and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. So many of us know someone directly affected by the virus, and you're reaching out to us to share the good news of recovery. Today, after 30 days in ICU, a Metro Atlanta man was finally released from the hospital. Caitlin Ross shares his story. In this room, in this room, can't go out the door. For 30 days, Robert Grant has lived in this 12 by 12 room at Emory St. Joseph's. He had me tied down. I couldn't move. I can't do this. I want out of here. I was so afraid. He was on a ventilator for 13 of those days and couldn't understand why he couldn't see his wife. Trying to tell them I want my wife. At the time, I couldn't didn't realize that there was no visitors allowed in the hospital. He says talking with her over FaceTime every day got him through COVID-19. My wife has been very supportive. If I need something, she would drop it off at the desk. He was encouraged, too, by everyone who took care of him over the past month. He is so grateful for the care and support he got from the health care workers who always believed he would recover. Have faith and do what the doctors tell you to do. Robert's being discharged from the hospital today, but he can't go home yet. He'll be transported to a rehab facility where he'll continue to gain strength and hopefully continue his recovery. We are glad he's doing better. Does Robert have any idea how he got the virus? No, he has no idea. He says his wife found him unconscious and rushed him to the hospital. Doctors there told her he got there just in time. Well, hopefully he and his wife will be reunited soon. They have an anniversary coming up. She won't be able to visit him at the facility, but she's hopeful he's going to be home for their 24th wedding anniversary, which is May 25th. All right, they got a few days to make it happen, actually more than a couple of weeks. So we wish them the very best yeah. and hope they're back together for that anniversary. All right, time for me to head out to get ready for Up Late over on 11 Alive at 11. That's where I'll see you next, Jeff, and I'll see you tomorrow. All right, Aisha, thank you. Friday almost here. That's the good news. And we have some good news. A lot more coming your way here on the Big 36. Many recovering from COVID-19 facing yet another obstacle, the mounting medical costs of their treatment. Stay with us. We hear you and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, 
live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. Local city and county leaders are starting to come forward with reaction to the order ending tonight. Elwin Lopez spoke with the mayor of Athens who expressed concerns about his community. Athens Mayor Kelly Gertz says he's worried about his community now that Governor Brian Kemp has decided to allow for the shelter in place order to expire tonight. Gertz says data doesn't seem to indicate that we as a state are in the clear yet. He says he will continue to encourage Athens to shelter in place until they see a two week decline in active new COVID-19 cases and then start a face to face approach. Gertz says he is concerned about mixed messages during this pandemic with Governor Kemp's decision to move forward by allowing the shelter in place order to expire and individual community leaders asking their cities to stay put. We're in a community of 130,000 people and under normal circumstances, more than 40,000 people come into our community every day to work. And so we, we do need to be unified and the unifying message that I'll continue to send is to look at the data and when the data indicate that it's safe for the first phase of reopening. That's when I'm going to encourage that. Gert says he also worries if we don't continue to shelter in place that we could see not only a second wave of COVID-19 cases, but possibly a series of waves. COVID-19 has been around long enough. We now have survivors to celebrate, but it'll take months, even years, for some to recover from the financial toll of beating the virus. Reveal investigator Rebecca Lindstrom looking at the confusion surrounding medical costs. They are the moments that keep hope alive, the cheers and reunions with loved ones. Those doctors and nurses, I mean, they deserve every penny they get. Not only did Bridget Cook survive COVID-19, but so did her father and daughter, who spent 11 days on a ventilator. But Cook herself almost didn't go to the hospital. In my head, I was going, we can't take another bill. We're going to lose our house. You know, how am I going to pay for this? And, and it's a lot. So far, the bill for Cook's care is $18,000. She's waiting to see what her insurance will pay, but she fears it won't be much. I read the other day, it pays like $300 a day for a hospital stay. And I'm like, holy cow. She has no idea what her daughter's care will cost. Hi, Daddy. Richard Pellegrino, a man in Cobb County, was on a ventilator for about a week. His bill? <laughs> it was $199,000 and change. And uh, you know, that... It was surprising because I've never seen that big a bill in my life for anything. 18,000 of that cost associated with two visits to the emergency room where he was turned away without receiving the COVID test. Pellegrino also received an experimental treatment. Yeah, I was uh, offered and accepted uh, the anti-malarial drugs. Which not all health insurance companies have agreed to cover. You literally just described the typical surprise medical bills in the area. Bernetta Hayes with consumer advocacy nonprofit Georgia Watch has a guide to help families navigate the patchwork of promises from insurance providers and the government. 
While most say they'll cover testing. The treatment aspect of COVID-19 um, health care is where the confusion and some of the surprises will come into play. The federal government has said it will foot the bill for the uninsured and Medicare, which Pellegrino has. Still, his last statement has him on the hook for $38,000. We're, we're living day to day. Just search GoFundMe COVID medical bills and you will find an almost endless list of families asking for help. Families like Cook, who made the tough decision not to get the inhaler prescribed as part of her COVID recovery. Well, it was like $360. That's a car payment. That's part of our house payment. But Cook says she doesn't regret the decision to go to the hospital. Her husband put it simply. I'd rather pay a hospital bill than a funeral bill for you. And that kind of resonated in my head. From testing to hospital admissions, what are you being asked to pay? We want to hear from you. Email us at COVID-19 medical bills at 11alive.com. Again, that's COVID-19 medical bills at 11alive.com. And if you're wondering what to do next, we've put a link to this resource guide on our webpage. Many are struggling in Georgia right now with many businesses closed. 18% of the workforce in the United States out of a job right now. The unemployed numbers keep climbing. Here is a look at how hard coronavirus has hit our economy just over the past six weeks. You can look at this bar graph and the most recent claims are there at the bottom. You can see the number of new unemployment filings going down, but those filings still add up to more than 30 million. And right now, more people are receiving continuous benefits than during the peak of the recession. One beacon of hope, at least for small business owners, is renewed funding for the Paycheck Protection Program. Jennifer Bellamy has the story of one store owner holding out hope that she could get part of that fund. For Laura Saunders, it's business from a distance. She owns Inman Park Pet Works, and like many other small businesses, the coronavirus pandemic has taken a major bite out of her operations. We are on average about 50% down in sales. She sells assorted pet food and supplies and offers spa services for her four-legged clientele, but most of that has been kicked to the curb, literally. Saunders is one of the over 30 million small businesses that help power the U.S. economy. Unfortunately, they can also be the most vulnerable during an economic downturn, which is why the Paycheck Protection Program is so coveted. It can provide much needed financial relief, except for Saunders, that relief seems like a far off dream. I did it online. Um, I, I got all the necessary documents that they needed. They reviewed that and then they went to the next step and unfortunately all the funds were already depleted. The nearly $350 billion worth of initial emergency relief funds ran out in a matter of two weeks. Some of it snapped up by publicly traded companies and many small business owners felt they were at an unfair disadvantage. It's kind of a first come first serve thing. Eric Wilson is vice president at Citizens Trust Bank, one of the oldest and largest black owned banks in the nation. You've got five employees and you're ahead of somebody that has, you know, 250, we're going to process that in the, in the order that it comes. Wilson says when it comes to the Paycheck Protection Program, time is of the essence and working with a bank that knows you can make all the difference. Even before we knew how we were going to process our applications, we kind of reached out to, you know, some of the people that have been loyal customers to us. And we said, hey, this is coming down the pipe. You know, you got you might want to get your ducks in a row. Round two of the Paycheck Protection Program kicked off earlier this week, and Saunders wonders if she'll strike pay dirt this time around. I don't know where in the queue I am. I mean, there could be a million applications ahead of me, and it'll deplete what was funded. Saunders says it's a waiting game, and fiscally speaking, time is not on her side. Fortunately, the landlord is helping us out with the rent here, so that's giving us a bit of a break. But. You know, and it, it, I just have to rely on some of my personal savings account to keep our staff on and to keep the doors open. Most everybody is trying the best they can to stop the spread of coronavirus and to keep it out of their homes. But are you cleaning your shoes? One study suggests you might want to. Shannon Handy with our sister station in San Diego spoke with experts to verify what you need to do here. Think about all the steps you take daily, whether it's out on a walk or through a grocery store. Now consider all of the germs the soles of your shoes touch. According to a new study by the CDC, they could carry COVID-19.
It's no secret the soles of your shoes aren't the cleanest of all things, but a new study by the CDC reveals just how dirty they can be. Researchers examined the shoes of medical staff in Wuhan, China, the epicenter of coronavirus. It found, quote, as medical staff walk around the ward, the virus can be tracked all over the floor, as indicated by the 100% rate of positivity from the floor in the pharmacy where there were no patients. Furthermore, half of these samples from the soles of the ICU medical staff shoes tested positive. Therefore, these soles of medical staff shoes might function as carriers. For this story, we spoke with Dr. Joe Chu Sandyu at Sharpree Steely. We asked him to verify. Can shoes carry COVID-19? Yes, especially in areas where there are known coronavirus patients. You can transmit a lot of viral particles, bacterial particles uh, that are on the floor unknowingly to different places. Is there anything you can do to mitigate the spread? Yes, Dr. Sandu suggests leaving shoes outside your home or sanitizing the bottom soles. And really just remove all the potential bugs that are on any surface that made contact with the floor. We've got something that can help people more than we even realize. Upon hearing about the CDC report, Monty Deere, the CEO of Kizik, a shoe company specializing in shoes that slip on and off without using your hands, is giving away 1,000 pairs to healthcare workers nationwide. Log on to kizik.com to apply. As for the study, Dr. Sandu says while it is a wake-up call, not everyone should be alarmed as long as you're doing whatever you can to mitigate the spread. 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Time and again, you are reaching out to us to share how your lives have been thrown off course by the COVID-19 pandemic, but you're still working to serve others. Matt Pearl introduces us to a woman indicator who is making her mark one stitch at a time. It's really easy right now to see all of the hard, terrible things that are happening in the world. I think it's really easy to go to the negative if anyone had reason to go to the negative, it was Maya Costello. COVID-19 forced her and her fiance to postpone their May wedding. It's put both out of work, forced to chew into their savings. Seeing this, you know, statistics and the people who are losing their lives has just been really hard and that's sort of been an ongoing thing. So, um, yeah. Maya decided to bring hope. She found her mom's old sewing machine in the attic. She learned to sew she began making masks for healthcare workers. Then she extended her arms to her community. I just held up a little thing that said, please uh, read this post, it's almost my birthday. And I asked them if they would be able to donate $2, $5, $10, and I'd be able to continue to purchase materials and make masks. By the next day, we had raised $1,590. People are just like, blown me away with these donations. Like, it is just so <sighs> touching to me. So far, Maya has made more than 100 masks. It doesn't change the overwhelming need or the overwhelming negative of this pandemic. Her goal, to provide a path of positive. People want a purpose right now. In a time that's difficult for a lot of people, myself included, I think it was just a really, a really great example of hope. So Maya's making all these masks, but she's not doing it by herself. She's part of a group that has spread nationwide called Sewing Masks for Area Hospitals. Matt, we love that. Helping somebody or even seeing somebody help others can keep us all out of the negative. And this group has done a lot, right? Yeah, the chapter in Atlanta alone has more than 8,500 members, and they've combined to produce and deliver more than 22,000 masks. All right, thanks, Matt. So let us know what's happening in your neighborhood and share your videos from home with us. Just use the hashtag SendTheLoveATL. They just might inspire our next story. The struggle to stay open, a reality for so many Georgia businesses right now. Ahead, how an assist from the government is helping make sure Atlanta families can still get medical care right now. The storms that moved through our area last night are well off to the east. Now back behind this system, we have a northwest flow and plenty of cool air. Stay with us. The warmer air is coming back, though. We'll talk about the timing of that in your weekend. Coming up, Major League Baseball has changed its policy on ticket refunds. After the break, find out what that means for Braves fans who had already purchased tickets.
start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this. Metro Atlanta small business owners, again, rushing to try to get a piece of the $310 billion paycheck protection loan program. Many were boxed out of the first round when the money ran out. Bill Liss has been on the SBA money trail, and it's now saved one key health care center in Atlanta's West End. For the family health centers of Georgia, serving low-income and indigent patients on the city's West End, getting an SBA loan was critical to its survival. We would have been struggling to uh, meet payroll and we would struggle with other financial obligations. With a staff of 120 employees, the president and CEO of Family Health, Dr. Michael Brooks, says the more than $1 million he got after not getting anything in the first round is critical to one of the core missions of the center. We're seeing patients who are unemployed and uninsured. We, we see them all. We don't refuse care to anyone. And one of those patients is Ebony Winsonant. She's a single mother of two. She's been living in Atlanta's West End for 21 years, and she relies on the clinic for all of her medical needs. It is very important to me because, like, if I'm a low-income low family, I needed it, it's convenient, and if they wouldn't have got funded, my children wouldn't have got the services that they needed. What would you have done then? Nothing. I've just been out in the streets. Another key role of the family health clinics is offering free COVID-19 testing. 
which they've been doing now for more than a month. They say the loan will keep that going. And the president of the African-American-owned Unity National Bank, George Andrews, is helping make sure that Family Health and other small business owners are properly submitting their SBA loan applications to ensure they're getting the money that they so desperately need. We have submitted over 100 applications and 25 have been approved, representing somewhere in the neighborhood of five to $10 million. All of that money, says Andrews, is what's keeping small businesses alive on Atlanta's West End. Without it, Andrews says, many mom and pop stores and restaurants will be forced to close permanently. The showers and storms from yesterday moved out of our area and then that left behind this a northwest flow that has been uh, giving us the breezy conditions today and then also that's been bringing in the cooler air into our area and and that's going to be with us tonight and we're going to start off in the morning with temperatures that are going to be below average it's going to be a little chilly for this time of year in the morning but then look what happens during the day that cooler air starts to retreat and it moves up to the north and it's going to be replaced by this warmer air so tomorrow we're going to move up into the lower to mid 70s and then look what happens into the weekend more of this warm air is going to stream in here as we see our wind flow shift a little bit coming out of the west and then eventually the southwest and so saturday's highs will be in the lower 80s and then will be even warmer on Sunday with mid 80s here. And then that's gonna stick with us on Monday and also on Tuesday with those mid 80s. And then once we get toward the middle of next week, another front comes in. We're gonna have a couple of scattered showers around and that will cool us back down again. In fact, we're going to go back to temperatures in the 70s as we head into later in the week. And that all kind of corresponds with what we're seeing with our uh, extended outlook from the Climate Prediction Center. This is showing us for uh, May 7th through the 13th, cooler than average temperatures moving our way down here in the southeast. So while we're cool tonight and early in the morning, we're going to be really warm over the weekend. But that doesn't mean the mid 80s are going to stick with us. We're still going to cool down again later on in the week. And in fact, take a look at where we were today. 63, that's 13 degrees below the average. We should be around 76 degrees for a high for this time of year. Our low was just about three degrees below the average. So yeah, you know, we're going to see those temperatures that'll warm up a little bit more tomorrow. In fact, this is the timeline. We start off in the low 50s tomorrow. By nine, we're in the mid 50s. Look at these big jumps through the day and eventually topping off in the 70s in the afternoon. A lot of sunshine around, no clouds. So we're going to go with an 11 on the wasometer tomorrow, and we'll see the warmer air moving in for the rest of the weekend, mid 80s for Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. And it's also going to be a dry pattern ahead. We won't see any showers returning until we get into next week. And right now, they look like they're the scattered variety. There's that 11. You know, we rate your weather on a scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect 11 alive day. And we're going to have that tomorrow. Even though temperatures are just a little bit below the average, it's going to be bright, sunny, dry air in place, crystal clear skies. It is going to be a great day. And you can see that here on the forecast track. Sunshine in the morning, no issues coming in here, no weather features moving our way, just that uh, temperature that starts to warm up a little bit more with that sunshine. And then on Saturday, just a couple of clouds might mix in at times, but temperatures continue to warm into those lower 80s. And here's that temperature trend, 70s Friday, whereas today we are in the 60s, 80s on Saturday, and then mid 80s Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. Something else we're gonna see on Monday and Tuesday, a little more moisture, a 20% chance for a, an isolated shower Monday, 30% chance Tuesday, and then those rain chances go down Wednesday and Thursday as the temperatures go down again, back to those 70s. Yesterday, the NCAA made a decision that has made it a very real possibility that student athletes can profit off their name, image, and likeness. That means they could be in advertisements and get paid for those appearances. But as Alex Glaze tells us, there is still a lot to figure out and a lot to work out. Alex Glaze here with Jason Sechen. He's an, an attorney that represents college and pro athletes. Jason, when we're, when we're talking about student athletes profiting on their name, image, and likeness. An, an interesting aspect, I think, is gonna be that social media aspect oh, and yeah. athletes being able to, to market themselves. When you're looking at this from the NCAA's perspective, what is their problem with this gonna be? The fear is that you're gonna have somebody that owns five restaurants in the town that's a huge backer of the school and a fan and is gonna put some crazy number on the value of that uh, Instagram post 
and or worse, uh, try and attract kids before they even go to school. Some might say that you're only worth what someone's willing to pay you. So how do you regulate that? Well, that, that's very true. And, and there are a lot of people that feel like student athletes should make as much as they can when they can make it. The NCAA, on the other hand, does not feel that way. So it's going to be kind of a give and a take. The NCAA is going to have to police this and control it to, in order for them to feel comfortable with this process. It will be the Wild West to start, I imagine. The rules will have to be challenged and there'll they'll, they'll be all sorts of interpretations necessary. And, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a challenge for compliance offices at every level of the sports world. I mean, it, it will be difficult. But ultimately, I think it's the right thing to do. Kids should be able to make money while they're in college, just like kids that aren't playing sports. Some good news for Braves fans who purchased tickets through the team this season. Major League Baseball was not allowing refunds for games in April that may have been postponed, and now that is changing as well it should. It's because it is clear that there will not be a full slate of games, and there is a possibility that games will be played without fans. So Major League Baseball told teams they can determine their own refund policies. The Braves sent a letter to season ticket holders saying they can either be refunded the value of their tickets from April and May or receive a credit towards future payments and tickets. Single game ticket holders will have similar options. As many pro sports leagues continue to figure out plans to return to action, an idea that seems to be consistent among leagues is fanless events. President Trump shared his thoughts today on sports returning and what he wants to see once the threat of the virus has decreased. He wants to see stands full of fans once it is safe. If I watch Alabama play LSU, I don't want to see 20,000 people instead of 120,000 people. We want it to be the way it was. Now, we've got to wait till it's gone, and it will be gone, and we've done a lot to get rid of it, uh, but we, we want to open our country. The people want this country open. Still a long way to go, though, to figure out if you can have that many people together sitting in stands. How does, how does that work out? I mean, there's so many issues about social distancing at sporting events and how that's defined. Uh, I don't know. That's beyond my pay grade level, as they say. I'm not smart enough to be able to figure that out. I'm sure someone can. We'll take a break. Back right after this. More at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station.
today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended by. We're going to see a, a cool start in the morning with plenty of sunshine, and then we warm up during the day. High temperatures up to about 73 degrees, even warmer Saturday up to 81. And we're going to stay dry through the weekend, and it gets warmer on Sunday into the mid-80s. The rain chance is a low one that comes back on Monday with a 20% chance for showers, then a 30% Tuesday, then back down to 20% Wednesday with cooler air next week. All right, Chris, thank you, and that is it for us tonight. Thanks for watching. We appreciate it. We're almost to the weekend. Friday is upon us in about one hour. Flip over to 11 Alive right now for Up Late with Ron and Aisha. We'll see you tomorrow night. Same place, same channel. Depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you. We hear you and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Governor Kemp pushes forward with the new plan. Together we will defeat this virus and emerge stronger. In less than an hour, Georgia reopens ahead. Live team coverage on the new changes to your daily life. Help from Hollywood, new tonight after Sean Penn comes to Georgia to help flatten the curve. And life after beating COVID-19 